of uh, my firm, ESG, who I'll introduce in a minute. Thank you. And thank the Googlers for taking the time out of their schedule and their day uh, to share some what's going to be pretty fascinating insight into what they do uh, every single day in their environment. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll go through a little bit of information and some research and information about uh, our firm. Then what we'll do is we'll bring the panelists into a discussion. I've got some questions for them. And then at the end, we'll open it up for Q&A. So you'll have an opportunity to ask some of your questions and get further insight to uh, what these folks are doing. So Enterprise Strategy Group, we're an analyst and consulting firm. Um, we, at the end of the day, I spend my time researching and understanding what essentially you guys are doing, what things are changing in the market, what type of challenges are happening uh, inside your environments, and what are some drivers for change. So uh, I do that through multiple different ways, through a lot of uh, interviews that I do or with some just general uh, conversations I have, also with some web-based survey, get that information back, and then I start to match it with our clients who are the IT vendors. So I start to match that information and provide guidance back to them about some different things that are happening in the market. And I'll share some of that with you here for sure. So this ultimately started when um, I've had a lot of different devices in my career. So I remember the day back when I was installing Windows 98, for example, putting floppy disks <laughs> inside of a, a device, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and ultimately, I was one of the first Surface users. I remember when the MacBook Air came out, I was one of the first ones that actually went out and bought that. So I've used a lot of different devices. And quite honestly, I wasn't a giant believer when I put, first put my hands on a Chromebook. And it's very typical of a lot of the different uh, people I talk with. There's a question of, well, is that just an inexpensive device? Is it a device, how is it going to work in my environment with the tools that I'm used to? And ultimately, how can I use that? So it took me ultimately time to actually put uh, into the device and actually on the device where I started to learn, wow, there are a lot of different values here, which came to this concept of, well, let's talk about this day in the life of what a Googler does and how they experience Chrome OS in their environment. And then ultimately wanted to understand, well, what are some limiting factors uh, out there with mobility as well? What's stopping people from either using this type of device more often, or what are some of their concerns? And I'll share some research there as well. The other thing that was pretty interesting that I noticed is during a lot of the conversations I had, I had people telling me, CISOs telling me, that this is the only device that they'll travel with. And that opened my eyes a lot, too, to understand, okay, why are they traveling with this device um, due to its security and their comfort level as opposed to other, other Windows or Mac devices they may be using. And we'll get into some of the security features here with the panel as well. So one of the first things we did here is ask some of that top limiting factors, and this is a question we asked just to understand what's limiting users from doing more around these devices. And you can see, security is on top. We find that across all of our research. There's concerns about overall just uh, device preference and choice. Um, there's this whole idea of people are working different, people are concerned about performance in their environment, and they're concerned about privacy. So what we'll do is we'll take some of this research and actually map some of what Google's doing to how you're actually addressing some of these top challenges as well. The other thing we saw early on, this is a year plus ago uh, that piqued our interest, we said, all right, how are people using a browser? You know, there's more apps moving to the cloud, there's more just consumption from the cloud in general. And here when we asked the, uh, these IT decision makers uh, to give us a single answer of, you know, what are you using Chrome versus IE in this case? Um, if they were forced to choose one, you can see where they ultimately ended up using Chrome browser. And I see that pretty consistently and is something we continue to watch, but it was one of those initial pieces of research that got us interesting. All right, how are people using Google and Chrome devices even further than that? The next thing we did at uh, ESG, we spent a lot of time working with our clients to ultimately understand as you're buying anything, whether it be a device or a car or a house or anything, there's a lot of economic or kind of business kind of analysis that you're doing. So here we actually did a economic validation um, of Chromebooks to understand, you know, what are some potential trigger points here. And the point here isn't to say, yes, there's big numbers here, and of course it looks good, but it's not going to work for every use case. I put in, uh, numbers into this model that don't come out as favorable, and I put numbers into this that come out more favorable. But there is a model at that link that you guys can use and actually pro plug a scenario that's similar to what you may be already doing or thinking to ultimately understand what some of the economic hard cost savings would be, soft cost savings across the board. But it's another way to some of the ways that we've looked in insight of how people are using Chromebooks. 
I was just in a conversation yesterday with somebody that was using uh, Chromebooks, and he said, you know, rough and tough, I've saved 50%. And those came in device costs and other soft costs that they had. And you guys can, we'll talk some of that too. So really, let's get down to this, and we're going to take the uh, day in the life scenario really in three different uh, directions or topics. So we'll look at this concept of grab and go. So this is being able to use a device in a scenario where I may have forgotten this device, I may have dropped something on this, all these things that we see that are pretty typical in the environment. Uh, we'll also look at a very common scenario, employee onboarding. So I get new employees into the company. How can I get them up and running as fast as possible and have them be productive in the environment? And then we'll also talk a little bit about a remote employee. So, you know, more people changing the way they work, having these, you know, work from home type of initiatives or just out of the office initiatives in general. We'll talk about that scenario as well. So with that, guys, I finally get to introduce you. <laughs> so let's uh, thank you guys again for joining very much. Let's just go across real quick. Why don't we just introduce yourself and your role, and then we'll get into some topics and questions. So Russ, why don't you take it first and get the mic? Yes. <clears throat> Are we live? OK. <clears throat> uh, I'm Russ. Uh, I'm an IT operations manager at Google, and I manage Google's Grab and Go program. It's a Chromebook learner program for when our employees, uh, for whatever reason, can't use their primary device, whether they break it, lose it, lost it, or got it, whatever it is. Um, but yes, that's the program, and uh, we're also up on the, the third floor here, uh, if anyone stopped by there. Thanks, Russ. Uh, my name is Francis. I'm a program manager for Chromebook adoption at Google. So my core responsibility is to make sure there are as many happy and productive Chromebook users at Google as possible. Hey there, I'm Luis. I'm a corporate operations engineer. Uh, basically, I provide IT support to Googlers, uh, help them with Chrome OS and pretty much any other IT problem that they have. Perfect. So we've got a couple topics here. and. Uh, Russ, we'll start with you. And ultimately, what I, I've talked with these guys quite a bit, and let, there's a realistic um, fact that these guys work at Google, there's a Google environment, but I've also learned that they're very humble in the way that they talk about the different things they've done and how it may apply to what you may be doing or thinking out there as well. So, Russ, let's just talk about grab and go and talk about generally, you know, what started the program initially? Yeah, well, um in our tech stops, which are our help desks at Google, um, we have a lot of our users come to us with truly broken devices. And uh, the, the kind of quintessential version of that is, you know, like I spilled coffee on my laptop on the way into the office today. And um, that originally led us to try to get them back to work as quickly as we could, right? And in those truly lost device cases where this thing is not salvageable, um, we needed to set up a loaner device for them. So um, that's where we started with our loaner program. Uh, someone came in with maybe a MacBook, and it wasn't working, so we'd spend you know, half an hour to an hour setting up a MacBook for them. And um, they'd take it, they'd walk away, they'd bring it back when their new device was ready for them, and we'd take it back at the help desk, we'd deprovision it and wipe it and get it ready for the next person. And um, this was really an expensive process for us, and we were seeing as many as 10% of visits to our help desk just being for that, giving out loaner devices or receiving them back. Um, and our IT operation at Google is always trying to improve, always trying to find new ways to be more efficient and keep Googlers even more productive than they already are. Um, so that's when we started using Chromebooks, and it was kind of the same thing. There wasn't as much provisioning costs. We'd just hand them the Chromebook, uh, and they'd, they'd log in, and they'd have access to all their bookmarks and settings and things like that. Uh, but it was still kind of a pain in the neck, and we were finding that a lot of our, our users, a lot of our, our uh, Googlers coming to Tech Stops, um, you know, they, they had to wait for Tech Stops to be open, mm. uh, so they had to you know, wait until 9 a.m. when they had a 7 a.m. meeting. Um, so we wanted to do even better than that. And so that's when we uh, took our first stab at making this a truly self-service program, something that didn't depend on TechStop. Um, and spoiler, we, we actually got it totally wrong the first time around. Um, <laughs> we, we built a- uh, Google, you never get it wrong. Yeah, no, yeah, we, we definitely didn't get this right. Um, so we spent probably about three months trying to design and build a vending machine, a fully automated vending machine. And the idea was you'd walk up and scan your badge and this locker would pop open and there's a Chromebook in there and you'd take it, we'd know who you are and you were ready to go. Turns out building a vending machine is really tough. And, um, Unless you're Coke. Yeah, no, that, I mean, they've got it figured <laughs> exactly. out. Exactly. We certainly don't. And um, we, de we didn't want to spend the time on that, right? Like, that wasn't our expertise. We're an IT team. Yeah. Um, so we took another look at this after we decided to abandon our vending machine. That might actually still be somewhere around our Google office. I don't know. 
Uh, you guys are going to dig up a picture of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we had this epiphany moment where we said, um, maybe Chrome OS is the secret to this. Um, we can manage it remotely. We can enforce these policies on these devices where only Googlers can sign in. And we might be able, be able to find a way to say, hey, we know you logged into this device, so it's assigned to you. So we went down this path. And um, actually, the, the first person that I ever talked to, he's, he's in the audience here. I turned to him and I said, can we, do, can we know who signed into a Chromebook? And he said, yeah. Um, and he's still working on the project with us. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's where we started, and uh, we ended up building this really great uh, self-service program, and uh, we've, we've been really happy with it. Um, so far, uh, we've given out around 100,000 loans in just the last year alone, wow. and uh, we think that around 50% of the use of this program is to, to work around a true productivity blocking problem. So that person wasn't working, and then they grabbed one of these devices, and within minutes, they are right back to work, right where they left off. Um, so it's, it's been wildly successful, and um, we think the program paid for itself after only 50 days in the wild at Google. All the investment that we put in with all the devices and infrastructure and time paid itself back very quickly. What about from a little bit more insights from an IT perspective? So as uh, the audience here is thinking about how I would manage a program like that, what went on behind the scenes? I mean, I understand the front end is really them walking up and that experience they have, but how much work goes on behind the scenes to either set that up or once somebody grabs a loaner uh, Chromebook, you know, what goes on from an IT perspective? Right. Well, um, there are probably are, are um, three different domains that exist in the, the grab-and-go program. So one is the physical side, the, like the sign, the rack, the devices. Um, another is inventory management, and this is a, a very, very basic inventory management. So um, we have a team that maintains those devices, makes sure they're working, sanitizes them, uh, checks the racks, makes sure they're not a mess, that kind of thing. Um, and then the automation side. So the automation side is... Um, split into two pieces. There's a Chrome companion app that's pushed to every device in our fleet, and that's how we know who has signed into these devices, and it kind of walks people through the grab-and-go experience. Um, that application feeds data back into an app engine, uh, app engine backend application that tracks the whole program. Who's using it? What's the state of the program? Is this shelf empty? That kind of thing. So that sounds great. If I'm sitting out there in the audience, I'm thinking, that's fantastic. Is that available to me? So somebody out there thinking of a similar program, how, what kind of things would they use to get started? And those tools available? Is it something you did custom? How would they get their hands on that type of thing? Yes, actually. But before I go into that, I, it's important to note that uh, a loaner program like this doesn't have to have all those bells and whistles that we have. You can just take Chromebooks and put them on a table outside of your help desk or in the middle of the hall and let people use them. Because Chrome OS, you, you can very easily configure them to be secure so that only people in your enterprise can log in. We wanted all the bells and whistles because we wanted it to be a great experience for Googlers, and we wanted to know exactly what's going on in our program at all times. Um, but yes, so it is available. We actually open source the entire way that we do our program, from the code that we use for the automation to the things that we've learned kind of stumbling along the way to the process and the signs and the images that we use for our program. Um, all of it is available on our GitHub, github.com slash google slash loner. And you can read our white paper if you go to uh, g.co slash grab and go. Um, all of that's out there. All of it is the true representation of how we do it at Google. Uh, so perfect. So if I'm an employee, I grab a grab and go loaner. Um, what if I don't return it? Yeah. Well, that, that was our worry as well. <laughs> and uh, the first time we went to our, um, our IT asset management team, so this is the team that actually buys devices, like writes the checks for them. Uh, we're just the team that tells them which ones we want and how many. Uh, the first time we went to them and said, hey, we want to just put these devices out there and let Googlers use them whenever they want. It was a, like an easy no for them. They freaked out. Uh, yeah. Um, and so the, the kind of uh, agreement that we came to was that we were going to put used devices out there. So devices we'd already gotten a lot of value from that had been returned. Maybe those Googlers left the company or they'd gotten a new device since, since having that one. Um, so we put these used devices out there. and. We said, we're going to watch it, right? We're going to see how many of those devices disappear, how many people just hang on to them. And uh, we found that somewhere between 1% and 3% didn't come back to us. But many of those were probably just devices that were broken or not working. Uh, there really wasn't any theft, right? So these devices are fully locked down. We enforce uh, domain login, like I said, so only Google.com accounts can log into them. And uh, there's no way to make that not a thing. So even if you power wash these devices, we have domain re-enrollment enforced as well. So it just comes right back onto our domain. 
Um, so we know where most of them are, the vast majority of them are, and uh, loss really hasn't been a big problem for us. Those one to three percent that we do lose, that's baked right into our ROI formula, and it's really a drop in the bucket in the, the amount of time that we're saving for Googlers. What kind of things do you feel that you may not have quite right now with the program and you're looking to improve over the next you know, year, six months, whatever it may be? Yeah, so the checkout process and return process are still a little bit clunky for our users. Um, when they take a device, it feels a lot like they're stealing a device because there's nobody there watching them, giving it to them. Uh, and the same is true for when they're returning it, right? So I just put it back on the shelf. How does anyone know I put it here? Yeah. Um, so we've baked things into that Chrome companion app that I mentioned before that kind of walk people through, like, yes, it's okay. You just put it there. You just plug it in. That's it. Um, so that's one thing that we're still working on. We're doing a lot of UX work there. And um, the other thing is we're trying to do a better job of surfacing where devices might be. So in times where there's a conference in town, like Google Cloud Next, um, a lot of our devices end up going off those shelves. And we want to have a way to respond to those kind of fluctuations in supply. So we're doing some work to better understand the signals that we have and how we can generate more signals on what's available when. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll ask this question. Anybody can answer this one. So if I'm an audience member out here and I'm thinking my environment may not have uh, or may have limited Chrome devices in it, uh, I have, I'm using Chrome browser potentially, but I may be using other Office productivity besides G Suite. Are there opportunities I should be thinking about, meaning a use case, certain employees, certain scenarios um, that would be top of mind where I could be thinking of how I could use it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the top use cases ultimately, Francis? Right? What are for grab and go? For grab for and go, and not just inside of Google, but out that you'd be also thinking about inside. If you were to go to a company tomorrow outside of Google, where would you start? That's really as simple as this. Ah, okay, great. Uh, so obviously, my mission is getting as many Chromebooks to as many users as possible, and to find out what makes them productive on Chrome OS, and if they're great candidates for basically what we're calling cloud workers. And so one of the things that we've done at Google in terms of trying to figure out great users is we have used grab and go as an interesting way to yep. surface people who can be productive on the platform. And we've seen symptoms from the grab and go program where, for example, people keep the devices for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good indicator that they're productive on Chrome OS and they start to sort of drift away from their other platforms. So grab and go has been a great way for us to get the device in the hands of the user. And one of the big challenges we've had with Chromebook adoption in general is overcoming perceptions that Chromebooks carry with them from their history and education or other markets. And so we have had to battle even internally this idea that Chromebooks are potentially low cost devices or underpowered or they can't do real work. And so grab and go has been a great way for us to sort of prove those misconceptions wrong. And so when it comes to starting with an audience, grab and go taught us a lot about where we should start. We saw what types of employees were using grab and go, which ones were successful, who kept the device for a long time. And we can sort of ask those users what their workflows are like, or in some cases, if they're using G Suite products, we can surface typical applications they use quite a lot. Uh, and we can figure out what's a good sort of profile for a Chrome OS user just by getting users to use it. And so without grab and go, we've also introduced device pilots into the environment with people who we think their working context fits well with cloud worker narratives or basically uh, cloud-based operating sure. systems. And so we've introduced these devices to workers who travel a lot and spend a lot of time in email and are doing a lot of productivity execution. But we've also found engineers and people who are doing software development who have an affinity for developing in the cloud. There's also people who really just don't use a lot of local storage. We found indicators in populations like do they have a Google Drive sync installed? And are they using web-based notes applications? And how many hours are they spending in the browser? Grab and Go tells us a little bit about that, but also gave us direction in which type of users we should be looking for in our population. And so to answer shortly the question you asked me about where you should start, it's figuring out what working contexts have a natural affinity for something like Chromebook or basically cloud operating systems, and then targeting those populations. And the last thing I'll say about that, unless you follow up with more about it, um, is we often get asked, should you start with like salespeople or marketing people or administrators and things like that? Because there's this sort of assumption that their work is not complex. Mm. And that sort of perpetuates this narrative that Chromebooks can't do complex work. 
uh, which really bothers me personally, <laughs> uh, because my work is also complex, and I've been a Chromebook user for two years. Um, and so the, the sort of message that we're sending is that working in the cloud doesn't mean that your job or your work lacks complexity. It means that you don't rely on local storage by default. It means that you don't like to be tethered to a specific device. It means you want to get work done anywhere, and you want to get work done on any device that you can connect to. And when you're not online, of course, you still want to get work done, and Chromebooks can do that. So where we suggest to start is to look at contexts that really fit well with working in the cloud and look for those types of people. But don't assume that because they have the title of someone who makes a great cloud worker, that all people with that title are the same. That's a great point. And one thing that I'll add here is a lot of the customers that we've spoken to about grab and go specifically, um, they they kind of look at it as a good Trojan horse to get Chrome OS growing at their company. So I think Francis is describing a lot of these great ways to expand the footprint to identify people that are a good fit. If you legitimately don't know where to start, grab and go might be a good place to start. Um, it's a very clear use case. These, these people are not productive, and you can put a Chromebook in their hands and get them back to work. At the very least, checking email using cloud applications, um, maybe not doing everything they're used to, to doing on their primary device, but um, it, it is a good place to start. That makes sense. Luis, I get a question for you. So what have you seen in a typical worker that may not have uh, any, or minimal, I'll say, Google or Chromebook experience? How have you seen them uh, what's been their initial reaction? What kind of feedback have they had? And then where have they gone uh, from that initial experience? Well, uh, in general, uh, because Chrome uses Chrome Sync and, and Chromebooks uh, are essentially uh, very close to Chrome browser, we feel like we see them instantly get used to it and they have very minimal problems just getting started. I think the biggest uh, thing we see is like maybe Mac users uh, yeah. wondering why the control key yeah. is their modifier key <laughs> instead yeah. of the command key. Uh, but once you explain that and the caps lock, they're rocking and rolling. They see their bookmarks there, their extensions instantly sync. I can't tell you how many times I'm helping people, and when they sign in, they see all their extensions load up, and they're like, oh, that's magical. <laughs> so it's, it's such a great experience to get uh, when, as soon as anyone tries a grab and go, or just has like, uh, just gets a Chromebook for the first time, so many times I see people just instantly take to it. What are you guys seeing from, you know, employees that may have come in with a Mac or even a Windows environment and their propensity or their likelihood to switch to a Chrome only or Chromebook only type of device? Yeah, I can talk a lot about that. Um, we, we started surveying Googlers at the beginning of this year um, regarding their Chromebook experience. So people who are using Chrome for the first time, we surveyed that population. And we also surveyed people who have multiple devices. So there are certain hardware scenarios where you can have a non-Chrome platform and have a Chrome platform additionally. And we asked those users, what would it take for you to give us the other platform back and just use Chrome? Yeah. And so we have a pretty good list of first impressions to go to your previous question and also um, things that are driving hesitance to switch and concerns. And when we survey people before they switch, about 70% of the concerns that we get are based around misconceptions about what Chrome OS can do. Yeah, yeah. And then once we put them in a position to test exclusivity on Chrome OS, we get 80% of people happy to stay on Chrome OS based on providing them with training and giving them, forcing them into only using Chromebooks. When you have the choice, it's really easy to stick with your traditional workflows and not make the switch. And I think one of the, the hardest messages that we've had to get to people is when they tell us that it's not like Windows or it's not like Mac, from, from where I sit, Chrome OS is not trying to be like Windows and Mac. Chrome OS is trying to create a new definition of productivity in the workplace. And it's based on search, and it's based on cloud, and it's based on moving away from local storage, and it's trying to create this sort of different type of working that once you understand what that's like, it feels more productive, especially if your workflows match uh, what Chrome OS is built to sort of accentuate in productivity. And so once we can get people over that initial idea that stop trying to make Chrome OS like your other platform, people get really excited about it. And so what it takes to, for people to give up their other platform is putting them in a position to use it exclusively, understanding where they have actual workflow, workflow friction, and to also celebrating with them where they've discovered sort of a new way of working that they're excited about. 
It makes sense. It makes it. And I mean, it sounds like there's some good opportunity. What I'm hearing just initially here is people are maybe looking to do it initially. There's opportunity with this grab and go type of um, scenario where they could get some introduction um, to some of their users of that platform. And it may be just simple things, temporary usage, or just to kind of dip their toes in the water um, to maybe see and do their own type of research internally to see if they'd see similar results that you guys have seen. Yeah, grab and go is a great gateway mm. for, <laughs> for Chromebooks in general, but it's also great for G Suite. So uh. you can kind of make this assumption. There's this relationship where if you're using a Chromebook, unless you've set up some secondary scenario, you're also using G Suite. And so it puts users into this full cloud experience. And if you can get people to be productive there, they tend to gravitate towards that as a preference. That makes sense. Yep. Let's switch topics to the middle one there a little bit and talk about employee onboarding. So um, I used to be in IT. It was a <clears throat> nightmare uh, to onboard employees in a lot of cases. And then uh, it was pretty rare that they wouldn't come back if something was not working or uh, <laughs> they had problems with something. What's the, what's the typical onboarding experience with Chrome? I'm interested in that. And then how does that either differ or is similar to other platforms that you guys also support? Well, at Google, we, we are constantly growing and are preparing thousands of laptops a month. Uh, Chrome OS, it's so easy to just get one ready for someone. Essentially, all we need to do is enterprise enroll it. We like to apply updates so that users don't have to, but that, it's much, much faster, like five times faster than on Mac or Windows, where we have to worry about installing certain software we like to have in, in there, uh, encrypting the device. Uh, all that pretty much comes for free on Chrome OS. And not only that, but we know that it's secure out of the box. It's mm -hmm. our most trusted operating system uh, from a security standpoint as well. What, and then what kind of tools, once that uh, employee, uh, once it's enrolled and that employee logs on, um, what kind of tools are you using from, I'll say, an IT perspective to either monitor the user, apply patches, updates? You know, how much involvement is IT having versus an end user having? Well, that's kind of the beauty about Chrome OS. You don't have to worry about updates. It's updating in the background. Uh, you, it, admin console has some things you can you can control it, but in general, you can just l let it roll automatically. Uh, there's like constant rolling updates, and for the user, it's painless. There, it's updating in the background, and a simple restart will get them back up and, and running. It's not like when there's a major version shift in Windows or Mac where they're down for hours uh, to, to get their system patched up and running. And what about uh, if I want to restrict, I'll say, applications or yeah. some document access? Are there ways that I can control that to, um, from an IT perspective? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, admin console uh, should basically has those kind of uh, restrictions on there. And not only that, there's some really cool things ar around e extension permissions uh, because you, you can give your employees permissions to install the extensions that they want, but then restrict those ex extensions based on what permissions they're asking for or what websites those extensions are acting on. So let's say that you have sensitive internal websites. What's really cool about the way that we do extension management is you could say, yeah, you could run those extensions, but these extensions can't touch these sites. So it's a really awesome way to like, just manage your, your fleet. Got it. And then give me some insight into, uh, let's just kind of make up a scenario. Russ has a Chromebook, Francis has a Mac, and you have a, you want to stay on Windows. <laughs> I'd, I'd prefer Linux, but. All right, we'll go Linux. <laughs> what's the typical provisioning time? That's what I'm really asking. You know, what's it take, oh. you know, knowing that somebody may support them, what's it, what's it take okay. to provision one versus the other? That's really. Okay, cool. so uh, right now, and provisioning times are always changing with the versions, and we're actually, we're really proud of all of our platforms at Google. We put a lot of engineering time to just make sure that every platform is secure, and we build so tools especially for all of them. So we're, we're proud of all our platforms, but th they do take longer, and they do take a lot more engineering effort. So for Windows, it's essentially like two hours and a half right now, and same thing for Mac uh, with, with Chromebooks, it's about, uh, I think, like 24 to 30 minutes to just get all the updates applied and enterprise enrolled from when you unbox it. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. I think one of the things that you mentioned was that we put engineering resource into our other platforms. And mm -hmm. one of the most compelling stories about Chrome OS at Google is that we're using the same 
Chrome OS deployment that our customers would get. Yeah. So we don't have a custom Chrome OS image. Basically, if you deploy Chrome OS at your organization, we have the same thing. We've obviously built fun things around it, but from a provisioning and deployment standpoint and the OS that we get and the updates that you get, we have access to the exact same thing. With Mac and Windows, we have custom images. We have to do that to maintain security and to control the updates and to do all of the things that we want to do to keep our employees productive and secure. But with Chrome OS, we're using the same, the same version. Got it. Uh, before we move to remote worker uh, and offline access, just a, can you, each of you just step through this whole concern I showed earlier around security? So uh, employees have a concern around security. Businesses have a concern around security. Um, I've heard all of you mention security at one point uh, already on the panel. Can you just, I'll say, just double click just the next level down there. What specifically um, makes security so much stronger or more valuable um, from an end user perspective and an IT perspective on the Chrome platform? Well, from an IT perspective, uh, Chrome is essentially built from the ground up with security in mind. Um, it's encrypted by default, and um, it has something called verified boot mode, where in this mode that you can enforce from an enterprise and uh, essentially from a device policy standpoint, uh, essentially the Chromebook will not start up if there's something uh, wrong with the OS. It detects any kind of change to the OS, any kind of tampering. Uh, and in addition to sandboxing processes and application, it's, it's essentially, it just creates a really strong security product. And with additional extension controls, it, Chrome has a very high security posture. I guess from an end user standpoint, um, I think one of the things that were mentioned in some of the earlier talks was that employees want most to feel like it's easy to get work done. Yeah. And security, especially on other platforms, users are very aware that it exists. Mm -hmm especially on platforms where you can install local applications without an internet connection, and you can connect these USB devices and try to bring in programs. Users are very aware when security is creating a problem for them to be productive or get worked on. With Chrome OS, by nature of the operating system and because of the way that security is implemented and that it's built on this idea of security, it's sort of obscured. Um, and so because of the nature of, of how that works, users don't have to worry about it, and they feel like they can just do whatever they want and that it's safe, and that if something's going wrong, the device will sort of protect them from making a, a, an insecure decision. And so I think for Chrome OS, that's how the end users are most affected uh, by that in particular. Yeah, I, I think the points that we've covered are both the points that I would have covered too, um, but one thing I'll add is, um, in the early days of our loaner program, this is like pre-fending machine experiment, <laughs> um, we did evaluate other platforms. And our assessment at the time, and I, I think it would still be true, I, I don't know for sure, but our assessment at the time was that any other platform would have been a mountain of engineering work to deploy a loaner program like this and have our security and privacy team still be happy with us. Uh, with Chrome OS, we just click a few buttons and we did things that would have taken months of engineering time um, so I think Chrome OS is not only qualified, it's uniquely qualified to be a part of a loaner program like this, um, which, which is really fantastic. Cool. Let's uh, check out the last topic here about remote access, and then we can open it up to some Q&A. So there's definitely a perception out there that Chromebook doesn't work offline. How do I handle offline workers? Um, what if I walk into Starbucks and connect to the Wi-Fi? Is it secure? Do I have the VPN? Those questions constantly come up with me. So can you address that offline worker uh, and how the scenario works with Chrome and what you guys are seeing even inside the environment? Yeah, I mean, my Pixelbook has 512 gigs of storage. So like something's happening <laughs> offline uh, while I'm not connected to the internet. Uh, so offline productivity is something that we care about. Um, obviously, the G Suite applications work offline. Uh, with the introduction of Android applications, which you can totally control uh, in your enterprise. There's a story about offline there as well. And so that's a lot of the, the misconceptions that we were talking about, and grab and go is a great way, but also just getting the device in the hands of the user and saying, just travel with this for a while and try it. Maybe take two computers if it's something you're really scared about. Um, that's just a misconception, I think, from a productivity standpoint, is uh, very much possible. Uh, was there another question besides offline? Uh, the idea that a lot of people inside of a corporate IT environment will have to use VPN. Oh, yeah. 
So um, Beyond Corp is what makes Chromebook users productive wherever they are without this need for a traditional VPN. VPN has historically um, been not a intuitive setup on Chromebooks, even though it's absolutely possible. And uh, we actually are reliant on VPN in some use cases, so it's, it's certainly uh, available. But Beyond Corp, which is something that we've externalized, uh, is a great suite of sort of security applications that make it natively possible to work wherever you are. And that's another example of Google working to obscure security from users. And in Chromebooks, Beyond Corp is probably one of the best examples of how that works. Beautiful. You want to add anything to Beyond Corp? Um, just that the idea of a traditional perimeter-based network is inherently flawed. Uh, the idea is that you have a, a zone where everything is untrusted outside of it and everything's trusted inside of it is not great because once someone gets inside to assume that they're inherently trusted, that's, there's a lot of problems with that. So um, what we really try to do with Beyond Corp is essentially try to demolish that idea, try to make it, make the technology make you as secure from a Starbucks as you would from our HQ. So, and w w trying to achieve that and make sure that we're strong everywhere, no matter where we're working from, not only has huge productivity gains, but it gives a lot of people peace of mind and again, also strong security posture.